Hi, I'm Chuck Satterley, co-creator and writer of the Claims Adjuster and No Other Gods Coming from Devil's Due in 23. I'm on Twitter at, at Comics Chuck, the web at uh, Defective Comics with an X.com, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Neil van Antwerpen, co-creator and writer of No Other Gods and uh, The Claims Adjuster. You can find me on DefectiveComics.com and various social platforms, uh, Instagram, and, and you're watching To Be Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this very, very early morning with two very talented and creative people. You have heard one of them on the show in the past. He is the creator of Monsters and Mayhem. We're joined today by the ever-talented Chuck Satterley and Neil Van Antwerp, co-creators of No Other Gods and The Claims Adjuster. We also were supposed to have Laura Halsby on, but she had prior commitments as well, too. So thank you both for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having us. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you are bringing to Two Geeks Talk. My my story will probably be quite short. Lover of comics ever since I was a kid. Um, living in South Africa, obviously, this the scene is a lot different to in the States. Um, we just don't have the massive industry down here that, that you guys have. Yeah, I always thought that it would be really cool to one day draw a comic. Um, always been creative and always drawn. I mean, I started drawing based on what I saw in comics, creating little superheroes and doing little strips with mates at school and whatever. That was pretty much it. After finishing studies and with, with the advent of internet, started making connections with people who are uh, like-minded in the comics industry. And that's kind of how I got pulled into collaborations on very, very small projects, nothing to really write home about. And then in a roundabout way, met up with, with old Chuck, approached me and a friend of mine, with a script, we were keen. I mean, gee, it's a script from an American comics writer. Couldn't say no. Got stuck into that and did a few projects after that for a UK publisher. Quite lucky to to work with with Jim Kruger at, at one stage. That was that was really cool. It's just having worked with someone that was fully into the industry and had worked with big names like Alex Ross and came up with some awesome stories in his lifetime. It was just, yeah, that, that was quite the experience. And then kind of fell out of things a, a bit, just life happens, gets in the way. And then what was it, about a year ago? Almost two now. Yeah, is it really? Wow, time flies. Yeah. Chuck and I got contact again on Facebook and started discussing things and decided that in our advanced ages to get back into the into the game. That's yeah, that's what's landed us where we are right now. And, you know, I like Neil. Uh, I grew up loving comics. I grew up as a son of a single mother uh, when I was a little boy in the bedroom. I actually looked down on a comic book store, so all I could see um, out of my window were superheroes. These big gigantic superhero paintings on the side of, of the store. I would bug that guy uh, all the time. I grew up loving him. I, I met up with a dude uh, in, in a convention in the early 90s. We, we made a comic book called Agony Acres. Just kept going. Uh, I, I created a number of other books like Of Bitter Souls, Smoke and Mirror. Did a bunch of stuff, but I, I kind of stepped away and uh, hadn't, like Neil, um, he and I were kind of away from comics for a good, I don't know, 10 years. During COVID, we got bored. <laughs> <laughs> and and now we've destroyed our own lives. Now we're making a bunch of books. Instead of slowing down, we keep speeding up. And I often stop to check our sanity. <laughs> so now we've got um, No Other Gods and The Claims Adjuster coming out from Devil's Due. Monsters and Midways that I'm working on with Jeremy Meggert and, and, and Nick Goodwin is coming out from another publisher that we can't announce yet, but we have a deal with them. I can't tell you who it is, but I can tell you that is the um, if you know your call signs in Star Wars, that's all I'll say. I, I, I didn't say the word. And then I'm, I'm working on another book with Jason Michalski and uh, Jeremiah um, Shaika that has a really long title. We're here for No Other Gods and the Claims Adjuster. And Neil and I, I do the writing and the and the scripts for No Other Gods and, and Neil does the art. Nicholas Michael does colors and Tom Orzakowski does letters for No Other Gods. And then for the Claims Adjuster, Neil and I co-story that book, Neil Neil's idea, and then I script it. Uh, Neil does layouts and Laura Helsby, an amazing young artist uh, from the UK, they do the art, uh, the, the inking and the penciling. And um, Leslie Atlansky does colors. 
uh, Chuck Molly letters. We have a lot to get into uh, as well as, as we do, especially with two books, because we want to give equal time to both books, obviously. And I'll, I'll leave this to either of you to describe the story uh, of these comics. But tell us what No Other Gods is about. And then whoever wants to talk about the claims of Jester can, can give us a summary of that one as well. I'll tell you, what, why don't I handle the No Other Gods? And since Neil thought up uh, the claims of Jester, he, I mean, it, it was his his seed and his 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 seed of an idea and everything that we that we fleshed out. So, you want to handle the claims of Jester, Neil, and I'll handle No Other Gods. That sounds good. Yep. So No Other Gods, uh, quite frankly, right off the top, I'll be as concise as I can. I'm a writer, which is, makes it hard to be concise. Uh, no Other Gods is a cautionary tale of tyranny. It is very politically charged. It takes place 16 years in the into the reign of America's first uh, dictator, first autocratic autocracy. Uh, the chancellor at this point, his name is William Mann. He was a uh, reality television star who was elected president when it was looking like he was uh, going to lose his re-election campaign. He uh, stop the election, claim voter fraud. I don't know, stop me if you've heard this before. Essentially let loose out of a prison uh, a number of super villains who he rebranded because there were good people on both sides. Essentially wiped out Congress, uh, killed the Supreme Court, uh, assassinated the vice president. His wife was uh, somehow missing. This book takes up 16 years later. And in, in this world, there are super beings. It's kind of a marvel mutant type of superhero beings. We call them enhanced biologics. They're very rare. The powers start to take place when, when you're 16, 17 years old. That's what happens. Um, in, in this world, man, he started with um, the media, uh, got rid of it. All phones are now state run. It is mandatory that you have your phone at all times. The chancellor can send direct messages to everybody because he loves to do that. Uh, and um, so the media was outlawed. The mail became outlawed. All of our rights started to be taken away quickly. Um, all of the gun advocates, they lost their guns because uh, dictators don't let you keep guns. It's not a good idea for them. And then finally, um, he, he got so full of himself, uh, he issues uh, the no other gods law, which is thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is um, no other gods. Hope is alive in the uh, form of a 16-year-old son of Pakistani um, Muslim immigrants. His name is Yafar Zadari. Basically, what happens in No Other Gods is it's a, it becomes a race to find uh, Yaffer, the dictator wants him dead. The old heroes who have run into hiding, the resistance, rebellion, I guess, they want to find him. It's about responsibility, it's about power, and, and it's about freedom. That's No Other Gods. We're really lucky because Josh Blaylock at Devil's Due saw some promise in it. Devil's Due, if you remember, also published uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in, in the freshman force. So he's no stranger to publishing a politically charged book. Because I'm telling you, we're going to piss some people off with this book. Wouldn't you agree, Neil? Absolutely, yeah. I've, I was just thinking now, when, when Chuck actually initially approached me, I think he sent me three scripts for, for different stories. And I read through them, and no other gods just appealed to me. I mean, it's got such a global human message. Um, I mean, it's written very much from uh, the current American situation and the way things were going there. That, but it's, it still applies to any person living wherever in the world. So there was just something about it that grabbed me. And obviously it included superheroes, which is, you know, people fighting and massive scenes of destruction, which obviously appeals to me as well. It was the one script that you preferred me to, to, to get involved in as well. And we just happened to decide, yeah, this is the story that we're going to do as our entry back into the comics industry. We realized the extent to which Chuck actually wanted to piss people off with this book. <laughs> especially when it started coming to discussing the covers and what we're going to put on the cover, what's going to attract attention. And I started off quite tame initially and Chuck just said, no, let's push it, push it even more. Let's, let's go balls to the wall in this one. And, uh, and see, oh. see how many death rates we can get. <laughs> well, in our first two covers uh, that Neil is doing, our, in our first cover, we chop Lincoln's head off and replace it with uh, Chancellor Mann and then Lincoln Memorial. In the second cover, uh, we work our way out from the Lincoln Memorial and we're on the reflecting pond um, with the uh, Washington Monument in the background. We basically have a Nazi masquerading as Captain America type. Uh, we end up putting a 
essentially with our, our great colorist, Nicholas, um, we're, we're going to have um, a burning cross on the water, of the reflecting pool. So yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're going to piss some people off. Uh, John Lewis, good trouble. I'm kind of glad that I'm living on the other end of the, of the globe on this one. We'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the second comic, of course, the claims adjuster. And Neil, uh, tell us that story. The idea behind it is actually quite simple. That's why I like stories to be. I like the, the, the core to be quite simple and have a very central message. But it comes from years of reading comics, thinking about the stories. Um, I think people relate to that easier then to embellish it from there on becomes easier you've got this this central theme that you're running on and i've always been you know reading comics and the types of stories that they all seem to tell is superpowered beings or people of power fighting it out and it's it's always their point of view but i've always been intrigued by what happens behind the scenes you know what what happens to the the man and woman on the street um, who have to live and share these worlds with these godlike humans and over time i started developing this idea things started slotting into each other i mean i I'm a big fan of um, psychological thrillers and <clears throat> stories that have many moving parts that that slowly slot together until there's a big reveal at the end. It pretty much came came to me and just what would happen if we tackle the story of of a superhero world from the point of view of the everyman? What happens after these massive battles? Who cleans up the streets? Who fixes everything so that the next battle can ensue and destroy everything all over again? And that's where the idea of, of our protagonist, uh, Leonard, came from. He works for an insurance company that covers these damages. Surely, if superheroes were real, that would be a thing. Who's going to repair all the buildings and, and replace all the vehicles and pay for all the medical costs? Um, and that's where Leonard is uh, fits into it but to add a bit of spice that i thought what what if he's, he's obviously a very clever man leonard has years of experience in in his business and decided to fight back no longer sit back on the sidelines and watch destruction happen around him that's where the the story kicks off so as chuck mentioned earlier the idea came to me in a very broad sense we had a chat about it something about it sparked something in chuck's imagination in no way am i a writer i mean I, I can appreciate a good story i can maybe conceptualize something interesting but to put words and character to it and story arcs and all of that that is just way beyond my my abilities well so neil told me about this idea of a guy who works for an insurance company that handles superhero battle damage claims and so i actually am an insurance agent in my day job uh it just spoke to me. I too like psychological thrillers. So basically, I guess the way we can do this without telling too much about the any reveals is that he experienced loss in his life and he sees loss every day from these superhero battles, like uh, loss of income from businesses that are destroyed or uh, right down to the fact that in the first couple of pages, we have a hot dog vendor whose cart is destroyed from a chase between character that would be our Batman and our Joker, uh, the club and the ice cream man. Imagine, I guess, if you took Seven and mixed it with the book Marvels by Alec Ross and Kurt Busiek. That's exactly what it is. It's Seven meets Marvels. Leonard Skolnick has seen too much loss, so he's had enough. They all need to go, hero and villain alike. And that's what this book is. He Every issue, he picks out a member of the Society of Altruism and their arch enemy, and he does it in a fantastically violent, dark way. <laughs> what is the movie that we were also talking about initially? Uh, the name eludes me now. The guy with the shotgun on the cover. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh uh, falling, falling Down. down. Falling Down. That's Mike, the Michael Douglas. Yeah. Falling Down meets Marvels meets Seven. Yeah. <laughs> satirical as well which is i think chuck that's something that you like doing that's in your wheelhouse so initially when we were discussing the the concept behind it kind of ended up finishing each other's sentences on how this was going to progress and develop and it's just worked out perfectly so i'm super excited about the project what's really cool is that there's so many dark elements to this and, and we get really dark and very violent and we temper that with the art and the costumes and the color. Um, Leslie Atlansky is the colorist. You know, we asked her to do real vibrant, like 1960s colors and, and, and all the costumes are based on Silver Age 
when, you know, simpler time, they're all based on that. And so you have this beautiful, colorful universe where all this darkness is, is happening. Laura Helsby is the perfect uh, choice for, for this. They are an amazing young artist and they're going to go places. Neil, Neil and I will keep going with our indie books and Laura will be uh, on like Fantastic Four or something next year and they're going to skyrocket. I, I think, you, do you agree with that, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, Laura is super exciting and excited about the story. And it's just wonderful working with, with an artist that's got that much passion for what they're doing. It kind of tempers the Chuck and myself, our, I wouldn't say jadedness, but I mean, we've been around the block and it's, it's really nice to work with, with a person that's got such energy. I liken our, our team on the Claims Adjuster to uh, Only Murders in the Building podcast uh, uh, show. The two old guys and, and the young and the, <laughs> and the young one, you know. So which one of you is Steve Martin and Martin Short? I think we decided that I'm off the short. Uh, I, I'm I'm happy to go with whatever Martin I'm left with. <laughs> we're, both, we're both amazing. So the, the question is, which one of you can play the banjo? That's the main. Oh, um, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I play a keyboard, and that's about it. And when I say keyboard, I'm not talking about a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Because I want to talk about your, your creative processes, both in, in the countries that you, you live and work in and, and how that influenced your creativity, especially being in South Africa. I'm sure the, the climate of comics has evolved and changed over, over the decades as well, too. One of the projects I was fortunate of uh, in looking into, or the artist, I should say, was William Kentridge. And, mm. uh, and his style of, of, of art was rather... Um, art and animation was rather uh, infor informative and, and inspiring in, in that regard. Looking at, at both of the cultures that, that you've ra been raised in, how has that affected your creativity, not only from an artistic perspective, but, but from a life perspective? Well, I think in, in my case, I mean, as I stated earlier, that the South African comics industry is really small. It's very niche. Some artists have made a name to some extent in South Africa, but it's, it's normally very kind of left field stuff. So what I grew up with locally was very story driven comics, I suppose very more towards fine art. So like William Kentridge, as you mentioned just now, and my training is very traditional. So um, I studied graphic design, but as part of that drawing was drawing and painting was a, was, was a large aspect. I also taught drawing at the university after I left there. So that's my jumping off point. I've always appreciated the comic style of, of illustration, but yeah, I've, I've enjoyed bringing reality to it. So I've, I've, I'm, as I said, a classically trained artist, my current method is still very much traditional. Uh, I use paper, pencils, erasers, and ink pens. And that's just the way that I like to do it. It's, I, I like that visceral experience of touching paper and exploring and feeling the texture of the papers. It's a very grounded and a personal thing for me. And I'm hoping that comes across in what I deliver and that there is some, some difference in my art to what else is out there. I think that the worst thing you can do as an artist, as a, as a visual artist, an illustrator or painter, is try to emulate. You discount yourself. Um, and eventually, all artists who start doing that will end up finding their own voice. So rather find that voice earlier on and, and refine it. Um, and that's really how I've approached it. So not your typical comics, comics route that I've followed, but here I am. Yeah. I'd like to also say, because what he's not talking about is the fact that he does all of this, these comics that we're doing together, but Neil does all of this because uh, while he has a full-time job in South Africa, he has a family in South Africa, but also he's in South Africa. And I'm not trying to be a, a funny here, but there are times where um, because of the infrastructure, uh, Neil has no electricity or has no water. He has to navigate all of that and he still knocks out pages both for no other gods and layouts for claims adjuster and i don't know how how you do it i i can't do it neither can laura um imagine working and all of a sudden your lights are out and it's not because you didn't pay a bill it's because your government can't figure out infrastructure no. you know no. i literally have to keep the lights on yeah I, I couldn't even begin to uh, understand how that how how i could work in that environment it's not ideal i can tell you that so, i mean i like to build momentum it's like a self-sustaining thing once i start drawing on something i want to carry on drawing because it gets better and better and you get into that groove and it's frustrating obviously when you're at a peak of doing a page and quite excited about what's going to happen next when 
there's no power and it's dark. You would have taken the evening off, but it is what it is. I'm still really lucky to be able to do it. I mean, in South Africa, this industry is, is really non-existent at the moment to the scale that it does uh, exist in, in the States and, and in Europe, I suppose, the UK. So I need to remind myself that I'm doing something that a handful of people in the entire country of South Africa can do. Yeah, that keeps me motivated and going. And obviously, every time I send something through, Chuck seems to really enjoy it. That is reward in itself. He just turned in a No Other Gods page where Chancellor Mann, our 90-something-year-old, fat, disgusting chancellor, is um, getting it on with his four wives and then shares his four wives with his son because he's a complete disgusting. It's like writer's Christmas every time Noel said a page. You know, Neil and Laura. Uh, yeah, it's like Writer's Christmas all the time for me. Uh, it's like, wow, you know, it, and it just, you, you think, man, he can't top it. And then he tops it. It's just, oh, it's so, so, such a joy, such a pleasure. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Since you both work well together, and, and I definitely would love to have Laura on as well in, in the future. As artists, when you got the script for, no other gods and the claims adjuster back. What scene did you read on the page that immediately came to mind that you wanted to create the art for? Wow. Um, well, I think for no other gods, it was very early on in the script. It was, I think, literally the first three or four pages of it. It immediately swept me into the world. There wasn't this this kind of you know slow fuse that only by the by page twenty were you into the story. I was I was immediately captivated by it. There was just there's a certain scene that happens right in the beginning, which I think uh, Chuck and I we we discussed just after I read it and talking about the offer cop scene. Yeah, that then followed by the forest walk scene. <laughs> it doesn't happen often. I mean, I've, I've I've read many scripts. This one just appealed to me straight off the bat. So I, I could identify with 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 a character. I could identify with the situation. Um, it felt real to me and I, I read the rest of the book and it just escalated. And the cliffhanger and Chuck's really good at, at doing these. I don't know. It's a it's, it's part of his style, and that's what I enjoy. And it's also ha happening quite a lot in, in the claims adjuster. Chuck just has a way of setting you up for what's happening next and then amping it up past your expectations. I just love it. So that was the one scene in No Other Gods that, that, that really got me. And in claims adjuster, I think it was just the way that you ended off the first book. I'm not going to give anything away, but I knew discussing the story with Chuck that we were going to go quite dark on this, but I didn't realize just how dark we could go until Chuck revealed it to me. And that kind of set the tone. And it actually, it's, it's adjusted the way that I've always imagined the story in my head. It's better now. So that's that, that very last scene. Unfortunately, can't give anything away. It inspired a cover and illustrations and, and drawings for the character. And immediately I could just see how this world was going to look. What has been your favorite piece of artwork back other than the one you just described I, from either Laura or Neil? With the claims adjuster, one of the things that we wanted to do was we, right off the bat, we wanted to talk about destruction and, and, and everything. So, so we talked about it. The claims adjuster is actually, uh, the layout is a landscape and not portrait. Sorry, every retailer in the world who's going to be mad at us. I think it's page two and three. It's a landscape double page spread. I haven't seen very many of them, but if, if any, but it's a landscape double page spread. So it's really wide. And what we did was there's just a bunch of damage happening. And there's a chase between the club and the ice cream man and their cars and that hot dog vendor that I mentioned, the hot dog cart is flying with hot dogs and missiles being shot out of the ice cream man's uh, ice cream truck. It's just fantastical. And um, a, a train, uh, an L train has been knocked off its tracks uh, because of it. And, and so what we did was um, we also put little post-it notes um, around every little bit of damage and we numbered it. And then our letterer, Chuck Molly, made a list of all of the damage and what it costs. And what I did was I had a, an actual property and casualty claims to give me some values and, you know, and what would it cost? So we actually did that. That two page spread was so much going on. So that's one of my favorites so far from Laura. And then uh, as far as Neil is concerned, there's this panel uh, by this character that Neil created um, called Rattan. He's a, um, a, a South African mercenary who is on the team of, of the good guy team in No Other Gods. And Neil had his son, uh, Luke, um, I also have a son named Luke, but uh, he had his son named Luke uh, kind of do a pose because 
you know, he's old school and, and still does that. The way it worked out in the book, it, man, it, I love that panel. I, I look at that panel all the time. And then Nicholas ended up coloring it. And it, it's supposed to be like a old video camera, um, the effect and the way that Nicholas and, and Neil uh, came together on that panel is striking. I love it. That's just one panel. You know, if you have 17 hours, we could go past, uh, that I love from, from Neil. But you know, that panel, the look of the character, um, and it's completely Neil's. You know, he, he's like, hey, I got an idea. I want to add this character in. And I'm like, of course, let's do that. You know, it's a really cool looking character. I love it. His name is Rattan, you know. That was one of the images you sent me, actually, I believe. It, it is because uh, be, because I love it. So yeah, I'm not I'm not lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is the hardest part about being a creative person? The beginning, the middle, or the end of your creative process? I think the whole thing. I think there are a few creative people out there who don't suffer from imposter syndrome, um, where you always feel like I'm uh, I'm just actually not not good enough to do this which is obviously it's it's restrictive and it makes you feel kind of um, self-conscious and, and doubtful but i think it's also the thing that drives you every single time i put a page down or i send it through to chuck i feel like that there's about three or four things in that page that i would have liked to change or would have done better but you got to move on it's a continuous battle with yourself it's a grind all the way throughout the project and i've looked back at some of the work that i've done years after the fact and I think it's only then that I can appreciate it and think, oh, well, that's actually not too bad. But during the project, it's it's a continuous battle to be better and impress myself. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a hardest critic. Most artists have that kind of internal battle going on. I've had a lot of publishers on the show in the past, and it's wonderful to see publishers just reaching out and, and grabbing independent comic creators like i've had band of bards and a bunch of others one name that that you brought up recently which i haven't heard it for in all, a very long time is uh, devil's do as a publisher uh, chuck tell me about them because that's a name that is really from the way back machine devil's do yes um jeff blaylock founded devil's do i want to say in 2000 or 2001 and so that kind of makes them one of the oldest independent comic book publishers in the industry. But for a number of years, Josh has stepped away from the creator-owned uh, comic side. You may recall that uh, Devil's Do brought Hack Slash into the world with Tim Seeley's uh, great, great uh, series. They also have done a lot of uh, licensed properties. They did, they were G.I. Joe. These days, they do trailer park bullies. Um, I mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Some of Josh's work, like uh, Mercy Sparks, Arc World, they did Scorriers, but they haven't done a lot of creator-owned stuff. So th we're kind of Laura and Neil and I and our two books are kind of their way to dip their toes back in the creator-owned waters. We're very appreciative to Josh because he gave us this opportunity. We're definitely going to not make him regret it. We're going to be on time. We're, we set a good schedule. We're going to we're going to hit our dates, and hopefully that'll open the door for other creators to go to Devil's Do. Josh is uh, experienced and, and his tools of scheduling everything is great. Uh, Devil's Do is a great great publisher to pick. So how, how did that conversation come about, especially when they're, they're dipping their toes with your two projects? I begged him. I knew Josh. He's a Chicago-based publisher. I live in Chicago. We were going to go with another publisher. That didn't work out. We had an agreement to go. Unfortunately, um, talking about longevity, that, that company still exists, but they aren't soliciting. And so I just begged Josh over and over and over and over and over and over again. Until just, just until he just relented and, and and just said, "If do you promise not to keep bothering me if I just publish your books?" I'm kidding. And he did his homework. He asked for all the scripts. He asked for all the everything, and he looked at all of it. And not only did he look at it, but his assistant and then also um, Kit, who handles a lot of the stuff there, they read it and they knew about it. I was quite appreciative. Our whole team is we worked out a, a, an agreement and. Uh, you know, after so many years, I'm really proud to say that I'm going to have Devil's Do logos on my books. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. It's not even just because of the pandemic, but the fact that so many creative people have been putting together projects that have been sitting on the shelf, so to speak, creatively. The surge of creativity, because I've done 90 interviews so far in 2022, and just the new faces and the new people and and the fact that new stories like yourself uh, like yourself and Neil are, are putting together and and coming up with is just incredible and I just love the fact that we're in we're in another second or third golden age uh, whatever the Hobbit form of 
second golden age is. I, I agree. Uh, we are in a time where if you have an idea and you want to put the work in, there's a there's an avenue for you, be it crowdfunding. I'm an old dinosaur who's getting my feet wet with crowdfunding. I just did a, a big omnibus. Um, there's crowdfunding, there's independent publishers. There's so much you can do right now. I, I would agree. We are in, we are in a great time um, if you're a creator. We're in a bad time if you're a political junkie, but a great time if you're a creator. Happy to be back into comics. I'm also terribly upset with myself for getting back into comics. <laughs> For those that have followed both of your careers and the, those that have actually gone and finally seen that you're back in the comic industry and, and the comic scene rather, then I think it's wonderful that you're giving uh, the next generation of, of creative people, you know, uh, new stories to read and, and to bug their parents to purchase. Yeah, but that's quite amazing to think that, I mean, it's, it's something that crops up my thoughts every now and then is that you put something out there and it's going to be out there, especially now with the digital age, if you create anything, it's a probably will exist forever. And it's quite amazing to think that an idea that got put into words and then was illustrated by someone will carry on long after we've moved on to other things. I don't think there are many occupations or, or hobbies or jobs that, that can claim that. And that's, that always just kind of amazes me. We're still talking about creators today that are no longer with us. Um, and that's the impact they've made on so many lives. I, I think it's great. I'm a little bit of a fanboy of the industry. But you have to be. If, if you're in this type of industry, whether you're just learning to draw or learning to write, you're going to emulate your heroes and your, your mentors and your icons and find your own voice eventually. And it doesn't matter what industry creatively you're in, art, writing, health podcasting, whatever the case may be, you eventually find what you want to say and how you want to talk with people and how you want to share your own voice with, with the world and the masses. And you know, if you can do it, then you should do it. It's just a matter of putting in the time and, and the work to actually get it up. Sometimes one forgets the opportunity that you have to do this. I mean, I have many friends who have normal day jobs who do very well, but they're jealous of the fact that I'm drawing a comic. It makes you think that is obviously it's, it's the child in us that never goes away. And if you can, you can still live that at the age of 48, I'm not sure I'm not going to reveal Chuck's age, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I've been 49 for uh, for a number of years now. Um, uh, I agree with you about the golden age, but I also would want to extrapolate a little bit from what Neil said, and that is one of the things that we should remember if we are with a publisher. And I've said this before uh, on Twitter. I've said it in a few other places. There are only maybe 17, 16 maybe 20 publishers in the world that are accepting creator-owned submissions. And yes, we have crowdfunding as an opportunity with a publisher. That means that you have these small amount, small numbers of, of independent creator-owned open publishers that will take submissions and actually publish you if they like it. Just let's think about Comics Twitter for a minute. How many people have stories they want to tell and comics they want to tell and are also creative and, and, and skilled and also have the ability to produce the book. That's a whole nother story, right? I mean, you could be creative as AF and you could be uh, skilled, but you got to still sit down and actually do it. You know, I've got to be, I think I'm conservative here when I, when I say maybe there's 50,000 ideas out there right now, it's probably conservative. So all those people are looking for a place to get published. You think about these publishers, how many submissions they must be buried under, right? I mean, buried under that you, i would bet that if you're a small press publisher you're probably like uh, you mentioned band of arts tim uh is doing great work uh, tim and chris at band of arts I, I gotta believe they're probably sitting um under like buried under two three hundred submissions I, I and it's probably concerning so the simple fact that you can get any publishing deal is a miracle when i see books that are late and i see books you know it makes me crazy. I can't even believe it because you, you, you should always respect the miracle. I, I, we've talked about our age. I'm old enough to respect the miracle, you know, um, and we've done the miracle with the books that I've come out. We've done the miracle three times. Um, we're three for three on miracles, you know, so I'm crazy appreciative uh, to the publisher we will not name uh until we're allowed to to doubles do to know people like drew at battle quest tim and chris at band of bards and, and the dauntless guys and there's just so many great publishers but just to actually get a deal is so hard i'm aware of it and appreciative of it 
I, I don't want to ever let a minute go by this time in comics without being uh, aware and appreciative of every moment. It's a valid point to to be brought up because when the show got started, I interviewed web comic creators and I still interview comic creators. So at the time, back in, in early 2008, it was the height of web comics. The fact that you had so many hundreds of, of creators and thousands of creators putting together their own pieces of work and were forced to publish it themselves because publishers either weren't around or the big two or three or whoever they were, weren't accepting new creative ideas because they have, they have their own stable. There was a huge shift in terms of the independent scene forcing you to be creative in your own way, which is how crowdfunding got started, which is how you know, Comixology made, made an attempt, uh, rest in peace, uh, as well as a bunch of, uh, of other online digital platforms that, that were trying to come about. But if it wasn't for, I think, the creative scene online, we wouldn't see, I think, the platforms we have today, like Webtoons and like Tapas and, and all of these other platforms as well. And the fact that there's now independent publishers that are, are actively looking for creative-owned work is just incredible in that regard. So there is no excuse or there should be no excuse to submit a story that's polished and, and well done and, and has good art and whatever to the creative outlets that are currently there. Yeah, I think uh, the key there, though, is polished and ready. I try to back as many crowdfunding projects as I possibly can. Um, it is hard to do a lot. Uh, I'm not trying to be a jerk here or anything, but I would caution some people to maybe wait before they tell their story and polish it. We're coming full circle. Neil talked about it's going to stay out there forever, right? You never know who's going to pick it up. Uh, so make sure that it's, you know, ready for prime time. You know, I, I see a lot of people like, for instance, uh, they may skimp on the lettering, you know, uh, on a crowdfunded project and I can't read it. I would urge anybody who's doing their webcomic or crowdfunding or anything like that. Look, if you can't afford a letter, I get it. No problem, but learn it, you know, but get it ready, you know, get better at it. If you don't have an editor, go get your friend who's, who reads the most and just say, Hey, look at the, look at this over for me, you know, get a second pair of eyes, you know, just make sure you're putting out into the world, something that people will enjoy and be able to read. I would tell a, a young creator to you know, do that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Wow. I'm going to have to take the easy way out there and say that it's not really one person. I think it was a sequence of events, which include numerous people. My mom didn't, didn't like the fact that I didn't read books. Because she wanted me to read more books. So the only way that she could kind of get me to read books was to buy comics uh, because they were pictures. Um, so my, my initial uh, introduction to reading was through comics. And that's, that's where all of that started, which then led to meeting like-minded people who also appreciated comics. And it's the culture that you then kind of get involved in. And then obviously there were creators out there who always, you know, you rush to your local news agency to go and pick up because you can't wait to read that story or see this art. Those, I think, all fall under one umbrella. So I, I can't really isolate a, a single person. I just think it's the, it's the people who got me to love comics that have inspired me. And it's that respect, I think, for the craft as well. As Chuck was mentioned, if you're a young creator trying to get out there, you need to really respect the craft of comics making. And uh, where, where I'm coming from in South Africa, maybe that, that respect isn't quite there. It's still kind of seen as a fringe industry, but it's true art to me. And I think that is also what inspires me. Put the best out there. That is the, the fake out answer to the question. <laughs> I just want to make good comics with my friends. I'll talk about inspiration this time around because like I mentioned about taking 10 years away. So this time around, I'm inspired. I could tell you about all the great writers in the past that have inspired me and all that stuff. But let me tell you, I, I, I'll just talk about being a good person this time around. Um, if I have bad news, I'm going to share it with my team uh, that I'm working with. First time around, I would, if I had bad news, I'd kind of try to ask it. Um, if I have good news, I want to share it with my team. I want, I want to be Phil Hester when I grow up this time around. And what I mean by that is he's one of the greatest guys in all of comics. He's helpful. He never keeps you away from the bad news or the good news. Like we have property together that was um, optioned 
by, uh, I want to say, Skybound Galactic Sony Pictures Television. And we, we got a piece of bad news for that. And he told me, you know, um, he's just super good um, with the people he works with, with his with people who reads his work and everything. So, yeah, I'm inspired this time around by trying to be as Phil Hester-ish as I possibly could be, which is just a good person. From a professional standpoint, you are both creating amazing comics and you're both putting together two amazing comics so far, and I'm sure many more in the future with no other gods and the claims adjuster. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? This is for you, Neil, first. I think where I am at the moment, yes, it's a continuous process. So yeah, um, trying to improve and always, always hit the, hit the next mark, but I'm, I'm really happy with where I am at the moment from a professional, semi-professional point of view with comics. I'm getting to work with really, really cool people making friends that I wouldn't have made uh, otherwise. So that's all enriching. And I, yeah, I think it's great. No complaints. I like being in a life insurance agent, so I'm fine there. I also love working with the people I'm working with. My son's in college and he's doing well. I'm healthy. I get to write stories and play in a comic book sandbox with my friends. So I would consider all of that success. Oh, and also um, I just got hired to write a, a graphic novel, 198 pages. I'm actually being paid to write comics now. Um, nice. can't really, it's something that's not gonna really be for comic book stores, pretty excited about that. I had a talk with a publisher last week. They're going to be taking me on to uh, write one of their company owned titles, um, smaller, smaller press. I just had a discussion with a friend and I'm going to be making a push. I kind of had that imposter syndrome. So I never thought I was, I would be allowed to submit to DC or Marvel, but I'm going to start hitting that path as well. I'll be making a, an absolute effort to try to have an editor at one of those books. Take a look. He's much more accomplished than I am. So yeah, I feel real good right now. I think success is measured in happiness, um, not money. And I'm pretty happy pretty broke <laughs> <laughs> the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures i'm going to sound like a like a fortune cookie but <laughs> failures inspire that's just the only way you you can look at it i'm sorry but if you get down on your failures and and start i don't know aspiring inwards and downwards that's the failure so yeah whatever roadblock you hit whatever mistake you've made fix it get better that's the the, the school of hard knocks I eat failure. Um, I drink failure tears. We talk about we're three for three, right? If you want to know how many publishers turn down Monsters in Midways, the claims adjuster, no other guides? Because I could tell you that they far out number three. You simply, like Neil said, um, so dust off, get up, straighten out, learn what you did wrong. Don't do that again. And then go forward. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, an artist, or whatever they would like to do creatively. Who knows what that may be, but hopefully they are creative in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? <laughs> It's hard for me not to get political all the time, and I'm going to try not to here as well, but I think we need to be students of history. Every generation needs to know um, you know, uh, history, uh, you know, um, and, and when I'm getting there, it's like, of, of whatever you, my father used to say, if you want to be a garbage man, be the garbage man. If you want to be a doctor, be the doctor. You know, um, my, my, my adopted father used to say that. And what he meant was, if you're going to do something, no, be, be an expert at that thing, right? Be, you know, know the history of the thing. Um, know how the thing is done, know, you know, understand the process of the thing. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of like a theme that Neil and I have been talking about this whole, this whole talk about making sure that it's ready, you know? So I am in insurance and I am in comics. I know the history of life insurance and I know how it's going and I know the history of comics. I know how superheroes came about it. I know, I understand what the gutters are about in comics in between the panels. I understand all of that. I would suggest to young people coming up that they also know their thing. If they know their thing, then they will be good at that thing. And being good at that thing will inspire people behind them. I think that's it. Maybe it's a simple answer to a hard question, but I, I just think know your thing. 
Yeah, I'm fully in agreement with Chuck there. Know your thing. It worries me sometimes when I talk to younger creators in, in whatever sphere that they get involved in whatever they're doing for the esteem and the reward, as opposed to getting involved with it purely for the passion and the love of it. That should be the first thing that you that you think about. Obviously, we all have to eat and have, have a place to live and have money in our bank accounts to to afford life. I think if you're purely out there to earn esteem and reward, you're going to possibly not do the best that you can. And whenever you you read a good book, read a good comic, watch a good movie, you don't think about the amount of cash that the person made off of this project. It's for the pure enjoyment of that project. And I think that's what the generation after should aim to communicate and get out there. It's about doing something really well that inspires you and, and, and gives you passion. And that should be the only kind of milestone. And just to link with, with Chuck's, if you're really good at it and you and you work hard, at the thing, the money will follow. Happiness will follow. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And because I like music, what would its soundtrack be? Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. That is... Was, is this the fun one? <laughs> this is the fun one. <laughs> what would the title be in the soundtrack? Sheesh. My title would be the roller coaster that is Chuck up down up down the soundtrack would be by queen because you know freddie mercury <laughs> so <laughs> <that's a dip. laughs> yeah chuck's roller coaster world and uh soundtrack by queen so there's a saying i'm not sure if it's if it's something that you guys use there in the states as well but it's um hold my beer and watch this mm-hmm. that, that would be the title and the soundtrack <laughs> Wow, I think Led Zeppelin. If we're gonna if we're gonna go with classic classic bands, um, I'll, I'll I'll go with a Led Zeppelin inspired soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chuck and Neil, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Kurt, thank you uh, for having us, for your hospitality, and for your show, man. Two Geeks Talking is uh, one of my favorites. I mean it. You know, I mean it. I do. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for being so, so, so kind. <laughs> Not a problem. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find No Other Gods and the Claims Adjuster uh, as well? Both Neil and I are the same website, defectivecomics.com. That is uh, C O M I X. So think detective comics that don't work with an X. Um, defectivecomics.com. I'm on uh, Twitter at Comics Chuck. Neil can tell where he's at on, on Twitter. We have a Facebook page for our studio. The books, The Claims Adjuster, and No Other Gods will be solicited in early 2023 in previews under the Devil's Due imprint. Oh, and Laura. Laura is on Twitter as well. They're also on our website, Defective Comics. You know, you can find Laura on Twitter easily. Go to Defective Comics and click on their social media links. You can find Laura of that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually terrible. I, I can't remember any of my own handles. I am on Twitter. I'm just not very active. I'm not a words person, I'm a picture person. So I do have an Instagram page where I'll I'll drop little sneak peeks of projects that I'm working on. Um, I think it's Neil van Anwerpen. I think the best <laughs> place would be the uh, Defective Comics website. I, I can't wait until they un, until Neil blows up after No Other Gods hope, you know, Hope and the first uh, Neil Van Antwerpen fan Twitter page is created because it's going to be Neil Van Antwerpen. <laughs> I, I, I'm ready. I want to see the bobblehead. <laughs> the, so the now Neil we have to open Funko Pop. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Weeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, because I am only one person, give me a break, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.